all right, all right. No pressure. Welcome, no pressure. <laughs> Welcome. This is talk is the 50 years of X, a computer odyssey. And it's not just a reminiscence of history about Unix and things like that, but I want to explain some things maybe to some of the younger people and maybe to some of the older ones who keep this information in the back of their head and I'm gonna bring it back out to the frontal lobes. I am the board chair of the Linux Professional Institute. I'm very proud of that. We, uh, the Linux Professional Institute does certification of uh, Linux professionals. We've been in business for 20 years this year. And uh, I'm also the president of Project Kawan which is a project to help university students earn money part-time so that they can afford university. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. I'm also the co-founder and advisor of a project called Caninas Lucas, which is to make inexpensive Raspberry Pi style of computers, not only manufacture them in Latin America, but also do design work for them in Latin America. And I'll talk more about that too. I write and blog for Linux Magazine, and I am, my newest position is Chairman Emeritus of WIT, which unfortunately I can't tell you what they're doing because part of it is we don't know ourselves, but uh, <laughs> the other thing is we're trying to keep it quiet. So before we get any further, I need to remind you that everything is a trademark of somebody and that Linux is a trademark of Linus Torvalds in, held in several countries around the world if you want to use the word Linux as part of your product, you can do that. However, you should really understand about trademark law and what it means and how to do it. And then once you've picked the name that you want to use with Linux in it, then you contact the Linux Mark Institute. It's free. We review your, your request. And if we feel that this is something that won't either cause you or us trouble, then we'll give you the, the rights to use that. And that actually helps you defend that against other people that want to use it. And Unix is a trademark of the open group in several countries around the world. It's used to define what a Unix system is. Um, oh, and at this point, you'll notice a little asterisk. The asterisk mean that this is a much, there's a much longer story that goes along with this. In the case of the Linux trademark, it's how somebody tried to take Linux and hold it and hold it ransom. We wrested it back from them. We created the Linux trade. I will tell you this over many beers, okay, <laughs> sometime, someplace. And I am really old. I admit that. I mean, I started off being an electrical engineer 50 years ago. And I switched over because I started programming in Fortran on an IBM 1130 computer through using a correspondence course. Thank you. The first five years of my life, I worked on mainframes, IBM mainframes, uh, programming in assembly language. But then I started teaching and I started working with different uh, de deck products and things like that. And in 1980, I went to Bell Laboratories and learned Unix. Um, then in 1983, I went to Digital Equipment Corporation to help them create their Unix products. I met Linus Torvalds in 1994, saw Linux for the first <coughs> time, and after that I've been doing only Linux and, and free software. I've worked for a large variety of different companies, large and small. Most of the time I've been working with open source, and we'll see that. But what I like to think of is I'm pragmatic. I'm not religious about things. In fact, I'm an atheist, but I you know, I don't spit on people because they use closed source software. That's their right, okay? But I prefer open source and I try and convince them that that's the right thing for them to do. And I'm gonna pack 50 years of history into this 90 minute talk, which I may not even get whole 90 minutes, I don't know. And my memory isn't what it used to be. So if you have some ideas and say, no, it wasn't that way, you forgot something and stuff like that. Well, you can tell it in your talk when you get up here. <laughs> so here it is, the year 2019. We have had 20 years of the Linux Fest Northwest. I think that's great. Thank you. Thank you. 
I see a little bit of the background of the behind the scenes work of this stuff. These people work on this year round. You know, they, they, they've been doing it so long that a lot of things are normal, but or, or they're used to it, but they invent new things as they go along. The Linux Terminal Server Project is an interesting project. It's also celebrating its 20th uh, anniversary this year. It was developed to allow you to use really, really cheap, inexpensive character cell and graphical terminals off of a server. And they run their project much like, you know, a lot of other free software projects. Great bunch of people. <coughs> LPI, the Linux Professional Institute, we've been going for 20 years. We have 150,000 certified people in 180 countries around the world. There are some countries we can't go into, such as Iran and stuff like that, uh, because of legal issues. Now, it's also the 25th year, a quarter century, which is always interesting. You know, it's 50, you know, 25 years, quarter century, right? Uh, of the of version 1.0 of the Linux kernel. Now, if you've done uh, software design, you know that version 1.0 is the version you say, hey, let's give this to the suckers, uh, the customers, <laughs> and see if they can actually use it. And that's what happened in 1994, when version 1.0 of the Linux kernel came out. And a whole bunch of distributions happened, started happening in December of 93 and throughout 94. Beowulf supercomputers, high performance computers, were first developed in 1994. And a lot of the major distributions happened. It's 30 years of the World Wide Web. Yes, Tim Berner Lee in 1989 developed the idea of the World Wide Web at CERN. It took a couple years for it to catch on, but took off. And the infamous Unix license plate that was developed at Digital Equipment Corporation, so that everybody could have the Unix license, has been going on for 30 years. <laughs> I have had the real <coughs> Unix license plate on my car for 30 years in New Hampshire. And I keep getting all these tickets from Texas and, and California and stuff from people that have the fake license plates on their car. Please stop it. <laughs> <laughs> However, 50 years ago, Unix started. And a whole bunch of other things happened at that half century mark. People walked on the moon. The whole world came to a halt the day that people stepped out on the moon. And people all over the world were huddled in front of TV sets to see that. Woodstock happened, you know, big music festival. Everybody, you know, started a lot of the bands we all, that the older people really like. In New York City, the Stonewall Inn had a riot, a bunch of uh, uh, what we call dykes, of uh, women, uh, men dressed up as women, um, happened and it started the LGBTQ movement in the USA. In Bell Labs in New Jersey, two people, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, started the Unix operating system. They were researchers. It was just for fun, just for research. They didn't expect it was going to have any big impact on the world. And you know, we can go, we'll go through a little bit of the history of that and why it was important. The ARPANET started, the basis of the internet started in 1969. And it was started the way that God and Al Gore expected it to go. So that was great. <laughs> Linus Torvalds was born in 1969. Yes, he is 50 years old, which makes me feel incredibly old, right? Because <laughs> I remember him as a 23-year-old uh, college student. And 50 years ago was the last time I ever shaved. <laughs> oh, and, and also the, last, the first time I ever wrote a program. So in the beginning, computers were, of course, physically huge. They might cost $2.5 million. They would easily take up a room this size. You would have uh, very large disk drives and things like that. However, they were logically small. You could measure their memory oftentimes in kilobytes. In fact, for a long period of time, the, the term byte was not actually fixed. There were five bit bytes, six bit bytes, eight bit bytes. And a lot of computers were termed, were, were designated in words. It was a 36-bit word machine or a 32-bit word machine. Uh, disks 
were measured in megabytes. I remember in 19, even in 1983, we fought to get a five megabyte Winchester drive, which is about this big, <laughs> and it would cost you know, lots of thousands of dollars. I forget how much it was. But it would, you know, we would fight to get that, or, or, or even fight to get a, harder to get a 10 megabyte disk drive. There was lots of lights on computers and switches on computers because you only ran one program at a time. You may not even have an operating system. In a lot of, case, in a lot of ways, the mainframe computers were a lot like embedded systems of today. Folks, there's still plenty of chairs down here. You don't have to stand if you don't want to. Um, so, you know, and, and, and if there was an operating system, it was typically very specialized. Specialized to do one thing, time sharing, or real time, or batch, <laughs> or an educational system, or a hospital system. Now, there's a kind of an urban legend about how all the companies create these different operating systems with different interfaces because they want to lock their customers in and make sure their customers could not go to another company. I worked for a lot of companies back <coughs> in those days. I don't ever remember that conversation happening. What I do remember is a bunch of engineers and product managers trying to figure out the best way to create an operating system that would help their customers use these incredibly expensive, horribly small, horribly slow machines in the best possible way. And if what we were trying to do was simply lock our customers into using our hardware and software, we could have done that with one operating system on each piece of hardware. Instead, a machine like the PDP-11 had 11 different operating systems on it. RT-11 for real-time, RSX-11 for combination of real-time and time-sharing. RISTUS was an educational system, really nice because it used BASIC as its primary language. There was, there was all these different operating systems for specialized needs. Now, I also want to talk a little bit about the, the uh, environment back in those days. When I started off in programming, going to Drexel Institute of Technology that later became Drexel University, there were very few professional programmers. If you were working, if you were interested in computers, you were a physicist and you wrote programs to help you with your physics. You were a chemist and you wrote programs to help <coughs> you with your chemistry. You were a mathematician and you wrote programs to help you do math. You did not write programs for other people, per se. And there was no such thing as a professional programmer. So in fact, I had a, I had a professor one time that towards the end of my time at Drexel said to me, John, you will never earn a living as a professional programmer. And 50 years later, I'm still waiting to find out if he was right. <laughs> There were no software copyrights or patents. Those didn't even show up until around 1986, right? And actually, the first time that software <coughs> copyrights were actually uh, applied was on ROMs for games, where the, the game manufacturers would make their ROM, put it into their game, and a bunch of people would come along, rip the ROM out, copy it, and, and make their own games. And so the government said, no, no, we have to do something to help this and software uh, copyrights came in. And patents actually followed that. The patents were even harder to get. No, the way that you protected your software back in those days, if you wanted to, was through contract law. So I, I would see somebody would have a commercial compiler that I might have to pay $100,000 for. I would contact them. We would start negotiation between our lawyers and their lawyers. How many machines you want to put this on? How are you going to use it? And what type of support do you want to have with it? All of this would go into a contract that eventually would be signed. And then a couple of weeks later, this person would show up with a magnetic tape. That was an engineer with a magnetic tape. And the magnetic tape had the source code on it for the compiler. And they put that on your machine and they assembled 
the compiler, and then they compiled the compiler. Then they ran a series of tests to make sure that the compiler was working properly on your machine. It took about a week, and then the person would leave. But then, if you were a very large insurance company, you would say, you're gonna leave that tape with us. Because in case something happens to your company, we need that tape to replicate <coughs> what you have done. And sometimes that went into some type of escrow in a, in, a, in a lawyer's office or things like that, but that's the way you bought software back in 1969, okay? Um, but there were a lot of people who just wrote the software and then gave it away. And these were the physicists, the chemists, the educators, and things like that. They belonged to user groups like the Digital Equipment Corporation User Society, DECUS, or SHARE from IBM, or Brainstorm from Novell. And you also had dial-up bulletin boards you could load your software up to. I was a student in 1969. I did not have $100,000 to pay for a compiler. In fact, I, didn't, I struggled to get $10. Okay, but DECUS had a software library and you could send away for a paper catalog that they would give you and you would look down all the different programs for different machines you have and you say, oh, there's a great text editor. It cost me $5 for the paper tape for it. Well, $5 was a lot of money to a college student back in those days because for $5 you could buy 10 pitchers of beer. <laughs> and so I was stuck, text editor? 10 pitchers of beer. I think you can see what direction I would normally go, right? <laughs> but this was the equivalent of free software. There was no copyright on it. There was no patent. In fact, the people had contributed their software to DECA so that other people could use it. So I would go to the school store, get some blank paper tape, stick it through my ASR 33 teletype, make copies of the text editor, and sell it to my roommates for a dollar a copy. And by the time I'd made the 10 copies, I had both my text editor and my 10 pitchers of beer. <laughs> I was the first red hat. <laughs> and we had user groups where we talked things back and forth, and Deacons <coughs> would have yearly meetings, sometimes attracting as many as 19,000 people twice a year to their conferences so that they could learn more about and how to use these wonderfully expensive, slow computing systems that we have back then. Well, that's all background for Unix. Because Ken Thompson had been working on a project called Maltix with a bunch of other companies, and he was pulled back from that project by AT&T because they were worried that you know, the government might think that the telephone company was getting into computing, and God knows that computing has nothing to do with telephony, okay? <laughs> so Ken is pulled back to Bell Labs in New Jersey, and he really loves working on operating systems. So he finds a cast off PDP-7 sitting in the hallway, and he convinces this other guy named Dennis Ritchie to come in, let's build this little operating system just for fun called, well, they named it eventually Unix. Where Multix was everything for everybody, Unix was something for one person. And they, they wanted to do a small kernel, very, very low uh, amount of information in it or functionality in it, just it made it easier to get it right. They wrote it in machine language. In fact, they didn't even have an assembler that fit on the PDP-7, its memory was too small. So they took, went to another computer, used a cross assembler to build the program, took the paper tape over to the PDP-7, loaded it in with the ASR33 teletype. By the way, that read about five characters per second. Kachunka, 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 right? Read it in, started it up, and of course, immediately it would crash. And that's where the lights and switches come in. So you use the lights and switches to set your addresses and look at all the values through memory and all the registers and everything to figure out why this thing crashed. And then you go back to the other machine, you make your changes, make the tape again and go back and they kept doing this and doing this. And eventually they got to work on the PDP-7. But about that time, the PDP-7 kind of ran out of steam. It was too small, too slow. So they wanted to get a much newer, faster machine called a PDP-11. 
Now, when I say much larger, much larger, it's 64K address space, okay? But there's cheating there because 64K of data and 64K of instructions and 64K of system space and 64K of user space. So it's fairly large compared to the PDP-7. But they didn't have any money for this. I mean, the PDP-7 was out in the hallway. Nobody was using it. Everybody wanted a PDP-11. So they, they, they couldn't get the money. Their department said, no, 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 we're not going to. So they went to the only department inside of AT&T that had almost unlimited money. Which department was that? Legal. Legal. Somebody said it. OK, legal, yes. The lawyers. And these guys convinced them that they would make a machine that the lawyers could do all of their legal briefs on it. So I'm going to put this image in your mind. A lawyer sitting down and using a dot editor, ED, to write TROF and NROF code and packages. And that's why we invented a really intelligent type of person called legal secretary. <laughs> Mostly women. And these women would eventually end up writing their own shell scripts and having their own databases and things like that. Very impressive. So they were so now they had the PDP-11, but they had to rewrite the kernel again because, of course, the assembly language or machine language of the PDP-11 was completely different than the PDP-7. So they wrote it again, and they got it working on the PDP-11. And about this time, Dennis says, "This is too much like work. I'm going to write this language called C, and it's going to, we can rewrite the kernel again in C." And then we'll never have to write it again, because it'll be done. <laughs> Except when we went to an Interdata 832, it had a completely different structure. So now we find out that there's parts of the kernel that are independent of the architecture, the scheduling and the memory, the upper scale memory management, things like that. And then there's the stuff that's lower down that really is architecture dependent. And so they start changing the kernel to do this and making the kernel more and more portable. Now, why is this interesting? Because the PDP-11 wasn't that fast. And what they're doing, actually, is making the, the hardware, maybe, making the operating system maybe a little less efficient. But it's the same operating system with the same commands across all these different pieces of hardware. Because remember, up to that point, the vendors were all saying, we're going to make the operating system to make the computer efficient. Oh, you just have to retrain all of your employees. Tough. Too bad. Now they were saying, you know, humans are actually pretty expensive, and machines are getting cheaper and faster. Maybe we should do something to make the humans more productive and not have to retrain going across all of this. So the other thing that was happening at this time was that Ken loved to go on sabbatical, loved to teach at universities, and he would go around with his tape underneath his arm to these different universities like Carnegie Mellon, MIT, and most famously University of California, Berkeley, to teach the students how to do operating system design. And these universities would start contributing stuff back to this project of Unix. And in fact, Berkeley went off on their own little trail to do their own version of Unix, which became known as BSD, the Berkeley Software Distribution. Even governments and, and companies would get this copy of Unix and do, you know, contribute back to it. However, it was not free. If you are a research university, you could get a license, I think it was $350, for a site-wide source code license so that you could use it in all of your machines. But if you were teaching at a small two-year technical college called Hartford State Tech, that was not a research university. And if you wanted a copy of Unix, first of all, you had to find the person inside of AT&T who would sell it to you. And then you would pay 160,000 US dollars per CPU, and you had to tell them what the serial number of that CPU was. 
Now, how many of you know the serial number of your laptop? Slackers. <laughs> um, I actually tried to get it. I didn't have $160,000. I couldn't get it. Um, and that was too bad. I would have loved to have showed my students the source code. Oh, I'm sorry. That's illegal. If you look at the fine, smudgy little print down in your contract, you're not allowed to show the students the source code. And this brought about a crisis a little bit a few years later where the students were now graduating and AT&T would come along and say, oh, did you see our source code? Oh, you're contaminated. You can't, you know, you can't go and work with any operating system any other place. This didn't go over well. I still have the button to say, get your, get your lawyers off of my computer. <laughs> There were other contributions of the, of the Unix system, though. How many of you know a person by the name of Doug McElroy? You should. You should know Doug. He was the actual director of the laboratory. He hired Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie into Bell Labs. He was the person who first <coughs> conceived of the concept of pipes and filters. And he had to write some of the first Unix commands, some of the simple ones, like spell and you know, and CAT and LS and stuff, so he could show Ken and Dennis how all these things fit together on this thing called the pipeline. And Doug is a really great guy, very humble, a very, very interesting person. But that was another contribution. And the shell as a separate program that you could just replace with another shell, or no shell if you want to, was another interesting concept that came out of Unix. Portable network file systems. I still remember the year of the network file system, RFS, NFS, and all these FSs. We finally settled for better or worse with <coughs> NFS, probably worse. <laughs> and then other things that came out, MIT with Project Athena, the X Windows system, and Kerberos, a network-based security system, and many, many, many more contributions that were either developed on top of Unix or made specially because of Unix. But then became the beginning of the end. A little company called Sun Microsystems had this really nice little computer board that they had designed to Stanford, and they were looking for an operating system to put on it. And they went around looking at different operating systems. CPM was just nowhere near powerful enough for this. They actually came to DEC, wanted to get VMS, we kind of laughed at them and said, and that was probably good for them not to try and put VMS on that. Um, but they went, finally went to University of California, Berkeley, said, hey, we want to put Berkeley Unix on that. And there was this guy named Bill Joy that came there to Sun to help them do that. You also know Bill Joy from writing VI, if you're a, Vim, a VI or a Vim person. And, uh, and so now they had their operating system, but they couldn't spend $160,000 per machine and to tell the serial number. So they went to AT&T and they negotiated a license. It was, I think it was about $350 for an unlimited number of people on top of this little board, uh, but it could only be binary. And you didn't have to tell anybody your serial number. That was good. You also had a two years of license that you could buy a little bit cheaper or the unlimited license. And, and people say, well, why do you have a two user license? Why not a single <coughs> user license? Well, you want a two user license so that UUCP could log in to your system and transmit information or the root, the person whose root can come in and, and re reboot your system or figure out what's going on while you're doing it. So that's why you need two users and not just one. Uh, other companies started to follow this. Now, up until this point, digital had been supporting Unix just by fixing the hardware and, and helping the, the Unix people put their Unix systems on digital's equipment, but we started to bring out our own Unix system. Most of these were BSD-oriented. Why? Well, System 5, at that time I think it was actually System 3, was still a swapping virtual memory subsystem. And you know, so it was limited as to how large your programs could be. They only supplied two compilers, a C compiler and Fortran 77, 
And then you had UUCP, which is a store and forward networking system that would actually call up your modem and log in and transfer the information and so forth and so on. BSD had demand page virtual memory, which allowed a, a program of almost unlimited size in those days. They had three compilers, uh, C, Fortran, and Pascal, but most importantly, in a lot of ways, they had already implemented TCP IP. And with System 5, or the, the, the Unix from the, the AT&T, you had to go off and buy a TCP IP implementation from a company called Wollongong if you wanted to have that on your computer. So most of the companies went with a BSD license. Now, what was the bad thing about that was the fact that the University of California, Berkeley had no advertising money to say, buy BSD, right? This is, this is the problem of Linux systems today. We have very little advertising money. But AT&T had a huge amount of money that they would buy the two-page spread in computer world every week to say, System 5, the right choice. It's a little bit like Microsoft and other companies. Now, there was one person who was a little bit upset about <laughs> this problem of these binary only systems. And that was a person named Richard Stallman, who in 1983 announced the GNU project, which GNU is not Unix. And he wanted to create a complete operating system with the source code available. And he started off with a thing called Emacs, a text editor. And a lot of people said, you could have stopped with Emacs because <laughs> it does everything an operating system does. It schedules tasks, it schedules memory, it, it handles I.O., it does everything. But he went on and he did a compiler suite that worked <coughs> across different operating systems. Now, what was really particularly brilliant about this, I mean, he could have started by trying to write a kernel. But if he did, there would have been nothing to run on it. So instead, he started writing code that worked across all these different operating systems, which attracted people that saw his vision of having this one set of tools and operating system that would run across all this hardware. In 1985, he started the Free Software Foundation to try and systematize this and to create this and go forward. Um, he wanted people and first to be portable across all these different operating systems. And this also allowed a bunch of small companies to start up. But companies like Primetime Software who would take a lot of this code and put it on CDs because people didn't have internet going to their homes and even then the internet that existed was relatively slow. And people like Jim Joyce who would have his Unix bookstore at little you know, Unix meetings and stuff around the world. And eventually, O'Reilly started up with books and everything, and, um, and started a whole mechanism of writing these books that showed people how to use Unix. There were also companies like Cygnus, who started up to supply support, commercial support, to the compiler suite for companies like Boeing. Now, this was, this was interesting, because commercial compilers would typically generate code that would run 30, 40, or 50 percent faster than the fledgling GCC compilers or the fledgling GNU compilers. But why would Boeing use that? Well, number one, they didn't have to pay outrageous prices for the compilers that did that. But number two, each one of those compilers, <coughs> as much as the companies tried to make them standard, they didn't run on all the different systems. That was the first problem. And the systems, when, they, when you went to a different compiler made by a different vendor on a different system, there were tiny little changes or, or differences in the syntax and the semantics of the compiler, which caused you, the application programmer, <coughs> to have to put if defs into your code to get around those changes. And the more if defs you put into the code, the more testing you had to do as you go across all these platforms because you had to go through every single path of your code to do extensive <laughs> testing. So Boeing, that was forced by government contracts to use different computers from, and different operating systems from different companies, had all these different compilers and their code had huge amounts of if-defs in them. By using 
the GCC compilers, they were able to eliminate large numbers of these if defs in their code and you know, make their code faster, easier to test, and more sure of working. And Cygnus sold support to Boeing and then later on other companies to do this. Now, about this time, uh, 1983, Digital Equipment Corporation was looking at all of this, and we decided to come out with our own uh, Unix system that we started off, and like a lot of other people, with BSD. And uh, I joined in 1983, and I was, one of, it was a, one of the first 16 engineers brought into the company to do work on Unix. And we brought out a couple different systems, Ultrix 11 for the PDP-11s and Ultrix 32 <coughs> for the Vaxes. Now we also started up Unix Wars, because now you had all these different vendors all vying for the same type of space. And Unix in those days was typically used <coughs> for scientific and technical use, which, which was about 16% of the commercial Unix market in those days, or the commercial computing market in those days. Scientific engineering was 16%. Business was 84%. <coughs> but Unix wasn't really looked at as being a business-oriented system back in those days. That was MVS, VMS, and there's other proprietary systems for doing that. Databases that ran on Unix systems because the file system was so poor and that the, the, the buffering that was being done in the file system <coughs> meant that the uh, databases had a hard time telling when the data was actually out on the disk. We didn't have synchronous writes in Unix systems back in those days. <laughs> So a lot of the databases would actually write to raw partitions, and then they would do their own backup programs that would go up on the systems, and it was a big mess. So most of the commercial software ran on proprietary systems. So we're, you know, all these different companies going to this kind of a small market, 16%, and they formed into two groups. Sun and AT&T formed together to form Unix Systems Labs, and everybody, you know, all the other companies go, oh, they're gonna try and force us out of the Unix space. So DEC, HP, and IBM, the strangest bedfellows <laughs> in the world, <laughs> formed OSF in 1988, and what they did was create a set of standard APIs and a standard test suite and then finally, a standard sample implementation, or sample implementation, that was based on Carnegie Mellon's mock <coughs> microkernel. Now, most companies never used that sample implementation code. That code was just used to test to see if their systems were correct. What, you know, if, there was a, if there was a question, you said, well, what does the sample implementation do? But what they, you know, HP, and IBM both changed their Unix systems to pass the test suites and run the same as the sample implementation. Digital actually took the OSF1 code and worked on it to make it more efficient and things like that, but we never implemented the microkernel. And one of the reasons is that as much as we worked on it, and as hard as we worked on it, there was still a two to three percent speed difference between using a microkernel and using the monolithic kernel. And even if you took all of the different parts of the microkernel and linked them together, basically creating a monolithic kernel, you still had a one to two percent performance difference. The people go one to two percent, who cares? We had customers with stopwatches. Oh, your system gives me 3,000 TPCs per second. And this system with a monolithic kernel gives me 3,010 TPCs. I'm taking this one. Nobody cared that it was a microkernel. But things change. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Sometime in the future, microkernels will be okay. <laughs> so this led up to the big suit between Unix Systems Labs and a little company called BSDI. BSDI was made up of a bunch of people who worked at, were at Berkeley. They formed this little company that was having a, a version of BSD that they would sell for 995 bucks per, per system 
for the source code and the binaries. And this was great, you know, people loved this, except all of a sudden they were sued by Unix Systems Labs, basically AT&T, to put them out of business. This whole lawsuit dragged on for years, about three years, and uh, out of this eventually BSD Lite came, which formed the basis of the other BSDs that we know and love today. However, by 1991, this was still not finished, and there was this young student in Helsinki, Finland, who had a brand new 386 computer that he had this crappy operating system on it that came with it that didn't do demand page virtual memory. Now, what is the biggest difference, the really biggest difference between the 286 and the 386? Memory protection. And it supported demand page virtual memory, right? The 286 and before that were all swapping systems. Protected and this mode wasn't uh, brain dead either. Pardon me? Protected mode wasn't brain dead either. There was a, a large variety of reasons, right. And this young university student realized this and he said, oh, so I'm going to write my own kernel. It's just going to be for fun. It's not going to be big and interesting like Minix. And, uh, and so he, he started. And you probably all know the rest of the story about that from there. So I'm not going to go into that. And if you don't know it, you should learn it. <laughs> but why was this time the time that this happened? And it was because these cheap, powerful, systems from Intel were coming out. And not only were they coming out, but they were slightly past. The 486 was on the horizon. People were starting to take these 386s and said, oh, I can dedicate this. I can give one of these to my kid, right? I can dedicate this to working on this hobby of mine where I use this other system for my real work. And the other thing was that Faster internet was coming to the home, not just the universities, not just to work. People didn't want to work on their hobby in these places. They wanted to work on their hobby at home. They didn't want to get mixed up with their work software. And much information was online, readily available in documents and programs and things. And Minix was there, so you could look at that, and lots of other ones that were there. And so, you know, and by this period of time, the World Wide Web was maturing, so documentation was easier to read, easier to get, things like that. Even porn was easier. <laughs> I still remember you know, trying to bring all the different binaries of the different read, me, read groups, you know, and put them together and unpack them so I could get some decent porn. <laughs> What's wrong with Gopher? Well, <laughs> I used Gopher, and Gopher was fine, but you still, it was the size of the files and stuff, and people, people didn't want to create, at least the, the systems I saw, they didn't want to create the really, really large file, because halfway through it, your line would drop, and you'd have to start all over again. I have, I have a, a couple asterisks and stories about that. <laughs> I still keep up Gopher, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, but, but this, is, this is 25 years later, okay? So. But it's fine. I have to finish. <laughs> so, um, so 1994, which is 10 years after George Orwell's 1984, uh, this, is, this is the thing. The vendors were ceding the desktop to Microsoft. It was, you know, the thing that ended up on the Microsoft, or Apple. Apple was uh, about 7% of the market. Microsoft was 90% of the market. 3% were other systems. However, Windows NT, was beginning to creep into the server space. And now there's a lot of vendors who say, hey, you know, we're a little bit afraid of Microsoft here. O'Reilly even started publishing books on Microsoft. They stopped publishing their Unix books. They started publishing books on how to program Windows NT and stuff. I don't blame Tim for this because he was in charge of a company. People worked for him. He needed to defend their jobs, right? Um, you know, so he started to do this because he saw that was the way that the marketplace, his marketplace was going. But then version 1.0 of the Linux kernel came out and all these different distributions started up and he says, whoa, I can recycle all these old Unix books to these <laughs> Linux people. <laughs> and so he did. 
you know? And then the only thing I really have against him is, please, Tim, just admit that you did this at one time, you know, so you're not necessarily the savior of Linux, right? In May of 1994, I, heard, I was working for digital in the technical marketing group with Digital Unix. And the Alpha had just come out a couple years before. Now the Alpha was a 64-bit processor and for eight years was in the Guinness Book of Records as being the fastest microprocessor in the world. And I heard about this person in Europe who a friend of mine went to come to Dicas, talk about this project. I'd never heard of the project before, didn't know who this person was. And they, you know, my friend came to me and then I went to my management and said, I think we should fund this person. I'm not sure what he's talking about. I'm, I'm not sure about the project, but my friend often has good ideas. So we got about $5,000 to buy an airline ticket and a hotel and have this person come to Dicas. And there he is. Uh, I took him out on the Natchez steamboat after listening to his talk about Linux and free software. And I said, this is really cool. Because what I was looking for was a way that you could do research, academic research, on a 64-bit address space. How many of you have ever read uh, volume three of Canoe's Art of Computer Programming, Searching and Sorting Techniques? I've read it three times. I read it when he was talking about 8-bit address spaces. I read it when he was talking about 16-bit address spaces. And I read it when he was talking about 32-bit address spaces. Because as you go in these ever-increasing address spaces, you find out that sorting and searching techniques that were impractical at the last address space now become more practical. So if you're doing a hashing technique and you have a 16-bit address space, you can oftentimes have collisions. But if you have a 64-bit address space, the idea of having a collision is much less. If you have a 128-bit address space, good luck in ever having a collision. These are all very important things. And I want people to do research in that type of stuff of, you know, 32 bits, you can hold 4 billion bytes of data, which sounds like a lot. But with that, you could probably emulate the cockpit of a Boeing 747. With 64 bits, you can not only emulate the cockpit of the 747 one time, you can emulate the entire plane every six months of its useful life without running out of address space. With four gigabytes, with a 64-bit address space, you can store 128 bytes of data for every square millimeter of surface on the Earth, including all the oceans. You can fill up a one gigabyte disk every second of the day for the next 5,386 years and still not run out of address space. It's big. And so if what you're trying to do is render Lord of the Rings in 70 millimeter you want to use 64 bits because you avoid something known as edge programming. Um, in any case, that's the type of, of work I wanted to do. And I saw Linux and said, this is perfect because if you do your research, you not only can write your white paper and have it publish the stuff, but you can actually take your code and hand it off to fellow people who want to do research. How many of you remember when they were trying to do the, um, the, the first genomes of, uh, of DNA? They were trying to do genome research. And they were using, at first, they were using Oracle to hold their data. But there was a problem. Because when they wanted to take their data and give it to somebody else, they had to unload it from the Oracle database, put it onto backup tapes, and then give it to the other pe people and have it loaded back on again. This is because of the license that Oracle had. Even if both companies had, an, or both <coughs> groups had an Oracle license, they still had to go through this process. This is fine when you've got a gigabyte of data. It's not so fine when you have a petabyte of data. Hmm. So with MySQL, which is what they started using, they could simply image the disk and say, here it is. Or even better yet, just give them the disk. 
So this is the type of stuff, you know, <coughs> why I wanted a, a, a free software platform to do this type of research on. And so I went back to my office and I basically blackmailed a friend of mine into giving an alpha system to Linus. Because I could have written a very long report, I could have made a very big proposition, it could have gone up 27 layers of management, and then they would have said no. Instead, I called in favors. <laughs> and by this time, I'd been working for digital for 16 years, oh, no, that's wrong, no. 14 <coughs> years, something like that. And I just called up people and said, you owe me a favor. I want you to send an alpha processor worth thirty thousand dollars to this guy you've never heard of, who's working on this project you don't know anything about, and you have to do it right now. <laughs> oh, by the way, I need another one for an engineering group. So that's sixty thousand dollars of stuff that you need to do for me. <laughs> that's the way you get things done in big companies. <laughs> and at the same time, I started to learn the power of the FOSS community. People were by Alpha Systems using their own money just to help out with this project. And Alpha Systems were not cheap back in those days. <coughs> and they did some amazing things, like write a better math library than Digital's professional engineers had <coughs> written. It was faster and more efficient and smaller. They implemented shared libraries. One person implemented shared <coughs> libraries in Alpha Linux when I'd had seven engineers who'd worked for three years to implement shared libraries in Ultrix, and it never happened. So, about this time, GNU Linux exploded. Why? Because people were starting to use this for things like ISP accounts, shell accounts. It was cheaper than Spark Solaris by about 30% at least. And even if you were given the copy of Solaris to put onto it, you could repurpose old machines, DNS <coughs> servers, you know, server systems of all types and things like that, instead of having to just throw them away or scrap them. In 1994, Beowulf supercomputers came out. Why is that important? We'll get to that in a moment, actually. And in 1998, databases like Informix and Oracle started to port. Now, if you bring out an operating system, or a new architecture, you find out, in, in those days at least, that there were certain applications that if they ported, you knew that you were on the right track. One of those was Mathematica. Mathematica was always looking for the fastest processor. They had a little engine, it was easy to port. You say, here Mathematica, you know, port your application, it's already done. <laughs> but we can sell a lot of them. Okay, and they did. And then a little bit later, databases. For the same reason. They had a, a, a little engine that was relatively easy for them to port. And when the database is ported, you knew your operating system would be starting to sell. Then in 2000, embedded systems. Because up until this point, embedded systems were typically standalone things. They were supported by various proprietary systems written by these companies. But what happened? All of a sudden, everybody wanted their embedded system to be on the internet. Well, now you need something that's secure, right? And you need to have something that has a TCP IP stack in. They're not easy. And so, and all these people had these different processors that started to come out. <coughs> ARM and Motorola and all these, which means different compilers. And, and the embedded systems people started to panic and then, they, whoa, wait a minute. There already is this operating system that supports all this stuff. It has a TCP IP stack. It is relatively secure. And it's free. And it's Linux. And almost overnight, Linux became the most used operating <coughs> system for embedded system designs. So let's take a look for a second at supercomputers, 1994. The companies that produced supercomputers, Cray, ECL, CDC, those, were dying because they would spend millions and millions and millions of dollars to develop these things, and then they would sell five of them. One of them to the agencies that we dare not say their name, and we know who they are, <laughs> and then the other 40 universities who never paid for them anyway. <laughs> and these machines were just incredibly expensive. 
And then three weeks after you bought them, they weren't the fastest one anymore. So you know, why have the second fastest supercomputer, right? <laughs> and two people in NASA, Dr. Thomas Sterling and Donald Becker, said, we need supercomputers. And particularly for this one really great class of problems called fluid dynamics. Now, fluid dynamics are every place. This table is fluid dynamics. The table may not be moving, but the heat inside the table is moving, okay? And if the table conducts electricity, or even if it doesn't, electricity moves in it, okay? Little electrons, is, everything is fluid dynamics. Weather is fluid dynamics. How many of you remember the, 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 the mercury capsules going up? Yeah. You put the astronauts at the top of the mercury capsules and the countdown would be going and they'd be sitting up there on top of this really big bomb, you know? And then all of a sudden, well, we're gonna halt, halt the countdown because the weather's coming in. Oh, yeah, yeah, the weather comes in. Oh, we missed the window. Sorry, guys, take them out of the capsule, unload the capsule with all the fuel because the window is passed and it is too late. Why they do this? Because they couldn't predict the weather with 100% accuracy. They knew how to do it, but the problem was it took so much time to collect the data, so much time to process the data to find out what the weather was gonna be. So if you wouldn't know what the weather's gonna be 24 hours in advance, but it takes you 48 hours to collect the data and process it, that means you know exactly what the weather was 24 hours ago. <laughs> So you speed up the process. Now it takes 24 <coughs> hours to gather and process the data to tell you what the weather is going to be 24 hours in advance. You know what the weather is right now. <laughs> if you keep going faster and faster, you finally can get to the point where you start collecting the data and processing it. And now you know what, exactly what the weather is going to be 12 hours in advance. You know, don't put the astronauts up in the capsule. Okay, And that's why for the last umpty ump years, there hasn't been a case where we said we're going to stop the, the, the launch because of weather, because we can predict the weather with 100%. We can predict in Japan, we can predict earthquakes 100% accurately 30 seconds in advance. <laughs> and people say, mad dog, what use is that? You're old, you can't even run to the door in 30 seconds, right? <laughs> No, I can't. But the thing is that most of the damage in earthquakes is, ha is caused by firestorms, gas mains breaking, electrical wires dropping, sparks happening, fires are created. And if you know 30 seconds in advance, you can turn off all the gas mains, you can turn off the electricity until the earthquake is over and then systematically turn it back on. You can lower the, the, the gate to keep the cars off the bridge let the cars that are on the bridge get off the bridge before the earthquake hits. These are the things you could do if you know about it. And if you have enough computing power, you can do this calculation for every 30 seconds. So they knew that if they could break down these problems, and fluid dynamics problems are very good broken down, easily decomposed, that they could solve a lot of these problems that they knew how to solve, they simply couldn't afford to solve. And by using commodity style computers, they could reduce the price to 1 40th of what it had been with regular supercomputers. Or looking at it another way, get 40 times the computing power for the same amount of money. And that's why all 500 supercomputers in the world currently run Linux used to be only 498 random <laughs> because two of them ran Microsoft. <laughs> I believe that's because Microsoft paid them to run Microsoft. <laughs> but recently they gave up, all 500 of them run Linux. And it's the, basically the same Linux kernel that you have on your laptop or your desktop. <coughs> now I inadvertently influenced this because we had just ported Linux to the alpha, and I had a whole bunch of CDs that actually had Intel software of the same version 
as the alpha version, that I was going around the world handing these out like Johnny Linux seed. <laughs> and I gave one of these to a student at the University of Hawaii. And he looked at it and says, yeah, that's kind of interesting. My father's an ISP. Uh, thank you. <coughs> Four years later, this student was at Los Alamos Laboratory, had put together a Beowulf system called Loki, and was using it to simulate asteroids crashing into the Earth to see what type of damage they were doing. For a while, he was making them crash into New York City, but after 9-11, he used Los Angeles. <laughs> His name was Pat Godin. That's a picture of Pat standing in front of Loki right there. When I called him up, because I was writing for a Linux journal at the time, I called him up to, to write an article about this. He says, you don't remember who I am, do you? I says, no. He says, I'm the kid at the University of Hawaii that you gave that CD to. And because you gave me that CD of Red Hat software, that's why all the national labs use Red Hat for their systems. They stopped doing that because unfortunately, Red Hat started to charge on a per CPU basis for support. That just wouldn't work, so they blew that one. Um, and today, all of the high performance computing systems, the 500 fastest computers in the world run Linux. Um, now, for the last several years, maybe for the last 20, 20 years, we've always talked about the year of the Linux desktop. This is going to be the year of the Linux desktop. <laughs> and, because, uh, and, and why this is so hard to do was because for a long time there was only one standard, and that was DOS Windows. I mean, I remember my father sitting in front of his Windows computer with his paper notebook, writing down each and everything that he was supposed to type in. You know, when you see this word, you type in this word. When you see this window come up, you type in this. And that's how they did it. But this was somewhat broken as browsers started to come out. Because browsers would change without you installing new software. Either the browser would come up and the whole page would be different. You know, Whoa, you know, that's not in my notebook. <laughs> and cell phones also broke this. So people now had to start thinking about the interface is what does it mean when this thing comes up and how do I react to it? Uh, so this has kind of broken that older standard. One of the reasons why the Linux desktop didn't work as well as we would hope it would was because of lack of games. Now, I'm not a gamer. I don't play games. I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I've never played games. I don't play board games either. I got text games. Dun uh, uh, adventure. Adventure I played twice. <laughs> <laughs> but now that's beginning to change because there are some games that are starting to happen for Linux systems, and that's great. That's wonderful. But the other thing is, when you buy a system, you always look for those five applications. All you want is five applications. You know, a decent office package, you know, uh, uh, a music player, you know, so. And the first couple, they, were not, they weren't hard to find. They would happen. The third one was a little harder to find. The fourth one was almost impossible to find. And that fifth one was really, really horrible. Now the reason for that was you had a different fifth one than you did. And you had a different fifth one than these two guys had. And you had a different fifth one than those had. Nobody could get that fifth application. But again, the web is changing this, okay? And so we keep getting closer and closer to having a Linux desktop. And more and more, now about 10% of the systems in the world on the desktop are running Linux. And I believe that as the third world <coughs> comes in, the people that can't afford to pay what most people call the Microsoft tax, there will be more and more uh, Linux systems on them. Or those who don't want the NSA leaving their systems. Or the, the, the lady said, or those who don't want the NSA on them. You're getting very close to what WIT is doing. <laughs> Um, so in 1999, I had some friends of mine who started up the Linux terminal server program. And basically what this allowed you was to use these Linux systems on these cheap or old computers 
to attach to whatever system you wanted and use it as a, a very uh, powerful and easy to use terminal. Another threat to free software is Apple. And I, I have to give it to Steve Jobs. He was probably the first computer person who said, <coughs> you know, computers aren't just for computer people anymore. They're actually for consumers. And I talked to you before about this, the size differences between the scientific market and the commercial market. The consumer market dwarfs both of them by many times. So when he started creating things like the iPad, it's not a computer, it's an appliance like your toaster, right? You just use it. And he took FreeBSD and hid it under a whole bunch of graphics. Um, unfortunately for Apple, Google and Android kind of foiled their plan of world domination of phones. <laughs> and the reason that this happened is if you look back in the, in the old days where Apple had 7% of the desktop market, they concentrated on people who were artists. They concentrated on education. And so they got that 7% of the market and it was profitable for them. The rest of the market, but, but, but they had a, a, a stack. They created the hardware and the software and they controlled the applications. And so they had this stack. And if you, and, and if you wanted to make money with Apple, you had to be Apple. <clears throat> The only people that made money with Apple was Apple. You had an Apple printer, you had an Apple disc, you had an Apple monitor, you had an Apple everything. Versus Microsoft said, if you could even say the word Windows, you could put our software on your hardware. And so all the other hardware people in the world <laughs> went with Microsoft and that's why 90% of the market was Microsoft. Trick question. What is a PC store, you know, a, a personal computer store? What does a personal computer store actually sell? Hardware. Nah. Nah. Nightmares. Nah. <laughs> shelf space. They have a certain amount of shelf space, and what they want to sell is when you walk in that store, you find what you want as quickly as you want, you take it up to the front. If you have to ask a single question, that's too much. And that's why in most PC stores, the, the person who knows about PCs has been replaced by somebody who says, can I get you, can I help you carry this thing to the front of the store? It's shelf space. It's what grocery stores sell. That's why all of your, all of your high priced must do stuff is up on the front of the store, but the milk is at the back of the store because they know you're gonna walk back there for the milk. And while you do, you have to walk past all these other things on the shelf space. And so you want stuff on that shelf that's going to sell really fast or have a really high margin. And most of the time, it's selling really fast. And that's why most of the PC stores ha would have the small Apple center at the back of the store because the people that wanted Apple, they're going to walk all the way back there. But at the front of the store and the majority of the store is Microsoft PC stuff, right? Yeah. So the same, you know, Apple tried to do the same thing with phones and Google came in and said, no, if you could even say the word Android, you could put Android on top of your phone and we'll help you. Which means that all these other hardware people will help to push and make Android successful. <coughs> and that's why in the future, I predict that Android will have 90% of the market, Apple will have a very profitable 7% of the market, and they'll be very happy, and their, their shareholders will be very happy. And now we have the cloud, where it's another opportunity for companies to hide the operating system, to hide the applications from the people, and you simply use them. The United States pirates 35% of its desktop software. Brazil pirates 84% of its desktop software. So I go down to Brazil and I say, hey, you should be using free software. And they say, oh, bad dog, all of our software is free. <laughs> <laughs> Which takes us back to the games. Why haven't games really taken off on Linux? It's because 99% of game software is pirated, right? 
So if you have, if you create a game and you're going to port it to an operating system, it only has 3% of the desktop space and 99% of the people who are used to using free software are going to pirate it from you. What, where is your profit coming? So instead, the first people you port to are the people who have 90% of the desktop space and are used to paying for all of their software and are used to getting it in binary only form. And then you might port to Apple with 7% of the desktop who, because their people are really used to paying for it. <laughs> and if you like Linux things, you might do that port too. So the cloud allows people to hide this stuff even better and you get to lease the software to them. They now literally pay for it forever. Isn't that great? And you give the illusion of privacy. Oh yeah, we'll protect your privacy. We'll do the backups for you and stuff like that until they don't. <laughs> and I should have had a long string of asterisks after the NSA. If you ever get me out in a bar, start talking to me about them. <laughs> We need to take back the cloud. So the summary of history at this point is that Unix created portable code and portable people and set the APIs for a lot of operating systems of the future and through POSIX and other standards, even proprietary operating systems now support Unix standards and Unix APIs. GNU Linux relit this. Unix was dying. I was there. It was dying. Microsoft was this onslaught. And <coughs> GNU Linux, through Richard Stallman, the Free Software Foundation, BSD, a whole bunch of different people, but mostly Linux, relit that. A lot of people ask me, why didn't BSD, that was coming out of its issues of legality and stuff, why didn't it take off like Linux? Two years late. Two years late, but another reason. No, no, BSDs were free. This is why. The BSD had, as its symbol, this demon <laughs> with <laughs> tennis shoes on and smiley face. But let me tell you something. If you had it on your t-shirt driving through Texas, you had problems, right? <laughs> and most of the BSD people, and I don't mean to insult them or anything, but they had these really long black beards. They looked a little bit satanic themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and, you com and, and you compete that with this nice young man with the sandy brown hair with wire rim glasses who spoke this lilting, perfect English with this lilting European accent coming from Helsinki, Finland have all got awful places. I mean, Finland has nothing about technology, forget Nokia. <laughs> you know, no, and, and it was just a perfect story for the press. Fortune Magazine, Linux on the front with all these sunflowers and you know, all this stuff that was happening, it was just great. And it was it, because it's marketing. If, you know, if it's technology that actually sells something, Microsoft would still be waiting to sell their first copy. <laughs> it's marketing, it's a story, it's, it's making, it's creating a channel so that other people can make money off of what you're doing. In the early days of Linux, there were a bunch of people who said, I don't like that these companies are now making money off the software I write for free. And there's a lot of people that left the Linux kernel project because of that. But there were a couple people, you know, um, Dave Miller, <coughs> Alan Cox, Letus himself, who realized, and me, who realized that if you stop trying to stop people from making money with Linux, then they will fight you. But if you allow them to make money with Linux, then they will support you and you'll go forward. And that leads to the last bullet on this slide, which is a lot of my managers laughed at me when I talked about Linux. And they, they because they said, you should be pushing digital Unix, is what pays your salary, da, da 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 They laughed at me about Linux. And now all of those people work for IBM. 
<laughs> and actually, IBM was one of the first large companies, other than me at DEC. I mean, it wasn't DEC that, that really looked at Linux. It was me and a couple of other people. But IBM looked at Linux and saw the future. <coughs> if you remember, IBM used to produce laptops and desktops and low-end servers. You, they cannot produce those anymore because the profit margin is too low to allow them to recover the costs of development. And so they sold that off to Lenovo. At the same time, they embraced free software. And they, at the same time, they doubled the size of the professional services group to sell solutions. What was the last time, except for Watson, that IBM ever mentioned hardware? Ever. Or software. They've never said anything about software. Never. It's always business solutions. Because in that marketplace, you can usually generate a 19% profit margin. <coughs> which is enough to sustain them. And one of the things I have for you folks, particularly the younger people, if you are interested in making a living with free software or even software of any type, think about a solutions type of business, helping people solve their problem. How many of you have a piece of hardware glued to your wall with a candle on either side like a shrine. Uh, Steve Wozniak isn't here. <laughs> How many of you have a box of software glued to your wall with the candles? Uh, Larry isn't here either. <laughs> because people don't buy hardware and software. They buy a solution to a problem. And even if what you want to do is to simply play a game, that's what you want to do. If you could play that game with two tin cans and a string, you would. It's the problem that people are trying to solve. It's the problem that they will pay you for. In reality, most of the time, almost 100% of the time, you can solve that problem better with free software than you do with, hard, with closed source software. So in the future, we're going to have users that don't really care about the freedom. <laughs> you know, we've seen them already. It's people that use Linux and they don't, they know nothing about the history, they know nothing about the real reasons why they're using it, they just use it like a tool. And that's fine. But we do need to educate them on this. Some companies say they love open source. Now there's three types of love. There's agape, in an ancient Greek, three types of love. Agape, the love of God for humans, the love of mother for child. There's philos, the love of brothers for each other, from which we get Philadelphia, philanthropy, philosophy. And then there's eros, the dirtiest love, erotic love, sexual love. Some of these companies love Unix at the eros level. <laughs> we have to be careful not to bend over in the shower. <laughs> we are very close to world domination, but we have to keep fighting all the time. Go out and talk to people about it. Talk to your politicians about it. Talk to your educators about it. Show them that by using free software, they can teach the students three times. Not just how to use the software, but how the software works to solve the problems they have. How to change the software <coughs> to solve the problems better. Talk about it all the time. I'm working on a bunch of different projects. Kininos Locos, I'd like to tell you, is to create a Raspberry Pi style computer inside of Brazil. The Raspberry Pi, for, for various reasons, costs $150 in Brazil. And these are to people whose GDP is two-thirds of ours. So I've been working for the last five years to create a systems of series of computers to create the hardware platform for the Brazilian IoT program. 
And this month, we're producing the first 2,000 of these systems uh, in medium scale manufacture to get them out to people who need them and stuff. And next month, we'll be going into high scale manufacture. Thank you. <laughs> Debconf, the Deb Debian user group uh, who puts out Debian will be having their meeting in Curitiba, Brazil this July. Um, is that Curitiba is my second home. It's the home of my godson, Kawa. I am part owner of a brew pub there and brew on premises place called Hop and Roll. We have 29 different beers on tap. None of them are commercial beers. And we're going to be bringing Caninos Lucos there to have the Debian people help us. And finally, I'm working on my retirement project. Mmm, plus BS. <laughs> Mad Dog's Monastery and Marina of Math, Music, Microcomputing, Microbrewing, Microwinery, Microdistillery, and Bait Shop. <laughs> <laughs> I have the architect. It will be opening in 2025. I don't Location? know. I don't know exactly where it's going to be. See? I have criteria. <laughs> the students, uh, uh, the students who will be going there, will be able to walk barefoot year-round. It'll be right by the ocean. And uh, we're going to, it's going to be a complex. We're going to have conferences there. We're going to have an incubator there to create new jobs and things like that. And the students will be required to teach the high school students of the areas about computer science. So finally, it's been wonderful to come here. I haven't come here for a couple of years. I remembered a lot about this, the great people, the nice place it is and the tie-dye t-shirts. And I'm glad none of those have changed. And why do I keep doing what I do, going around, talking to people like you? I do it because every once in a while, somebody will come up to me and say, I listened to you 10 years ago, and now I'm the CTO of my company. Thank you. I listened to you 20 years ago, and now I, am, now I own my own company. I employ 60 people. Thank you. I listened to you 25 years ago, and I started a small company called Digital Ocean, and I just sold it for a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I, that keeps me going. So if you want to see the most important person in free and open source software, when you get up tomorrow morning, look in the mirror. Thank you very much. <laughs>